ever visit the UK, there are a lot of things that you're recommended to do. For example, have fish and chips by the seaside, travel on a steam train, that sort of thing. But, especially if you are American and love your Hershey's, there is one chocolate you have to try, our own Cadbury's. But strangely, even the confectionery giant had its own railway connection. They had their own railway and a good six miles of track. The story of Cadbury didn't start in a grand and opulent factory, it started in a shop. And it wasn't even dedicated to chocolate. It was a small greengrocer's on Bull Street in Birmingham in 1824. The shop sold a variety of goods and compounds. Like many greengrocers of the time, they experimented. And John Cadbury, the owner, used a pestle and mortar to grind the coca beans and extract the sweet butter to make drinking chocolate and coca. His methods of extraction and chocolate making skills soon spread around the town and people were flocking to sample his wares. It led for the shop to expand to a warehouse in 1831. He worked hard for 16 years selling coca and teas, but once again his warehouse was proving too small for the demands of the customers, so the first factory on Bridge Street was created. In 1861, John passed the business to his sons George and Richard and they knew the need for more expansion. Also, they wanted to get out of the tea business and focus solely on chocolate, its largest seller. They settled on a patch of land near the town of Bourneville and in 1879 ground was broken on a brand new factory. Earlier that year, the brothers bought land and the estate next to the Sturchley Street station. The estate was renamed the Bourneville. They also planned something that only a very few factory owners ever did. They built a model town. The idea of model towns to house workers had been touted before, but never on this scale and not with the comforts that the Cadbury owners promised. They wanted the employees to feel as comfortable as possible. Houses were of top quality, there were amenities the staff could use and leisure facilities were readily available. They worked on the philosophy that happy workers were productive ones. The estate had everything, with the exception of pubs. As the family were Quakers, alcohol was forbidden and this stretched out into the local area. To get both raw materials and finished products both in and out of the factory, the company relied heavily on horse and cart to move the materials to either the canal wharf or the new goods yard at Lifford. But the fledgling factory quickly outgrew the horse and cart, as well as with the railways at its peak, it only made sense to build a factory line to move product quickly. The first line built was just to replace the horse and cart and ran to an exchange siding along the Midland line. It was run by a solitary locomotive. It was fine in principle, but continuing expansion of the factory meant that the railway was going to need a larger upgrade. Its upgrade came at the turn of the century. The station got renamed to Bourneville, six miles of track were completed and its fleet had increased to four. Three new engines came in from the Dick Kerr and Company Limited of Kilmarnock. They were small, slow but extremely strong and of course Cadbury made it known that they were proud of them. They were soon joined by Avonside's 040 tank engines. These were a bit more powerful than their older predecessors but they were perfect for the tight bends and could go within the factory itself. A bridge was built over the main line to take the goods and to waterside warehouses. It was a rather busy railway with three scheduled outbound trains every day, six days a week. Sadly, the Dick Kerr engines were commandeered for the First World War effort and were written off and scrapped sometime during it. After the Second World War in 1949, Hunslet number 1949 and Cadbury number 9 joined the fleet. It was described as a tidy, neat engine and when it arrived at the factory, it was merged into the fleet with a new chocolate brown livery and Cadbury lettering. This would be the very last new steam engine that Cadbury would ever purchase. But progression was hitting the factory. The golden age of innovation following the Second World War meant that time was done for the ageing steam fleet. The steam fleet was eventually replaced with four new diesel shunters and were given the brown and yellow livery. But even the new diesels were unable to stem the tide of the new road network. Faster and larger lorries were appearing on the scene and their versatility was not lost on the factory. It was decided to move away from rail and to the roads. 
and by 1976 the railway took its last loads and it was dismantled in favour of the roads. While the only real piece of infrastructure from the railway that remains is an old railway bridge, some wagons and even engines have survived. Hudswell Clark's 040 diesel number 14 sat outside the factory and Cavalry World. This plucky little engine was built by Hudswell Clark under the works number D1012. It carried a small 107 brake horsepower 6 litre engine and found its way into the factory in 1955. Although the engine was small by train standards, it could easily haul an impressive 200 tonnes around the factory at a top speed of 14 miles an hour. Due to its size, it was likely used within the factory confines, shunting both raw and finished goods to the waiting trains. After its retirement in 1977 following the railway's closure, it was decided to preserve the engine and it was sent to the Lalangdon Railway where it enjoyed a few more years of operation. It was then stood as a static exhibit until 2002. Following the opening of Cabri World in 1991, it was decided to bring the old engine home. It was moved in 2002 where she sat in the car park greeting guests. She was moved to various sites before getting resituated back in the car park at the entrance. It has since been donated to the Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Museum who have moved the engine to their collection and are planning to give the engine a full overhaul, restoring it to its former glory, including the original Cabri livery. Another survivor was Cabri No. 1. No. 1 was one of the Avonside tank engines. It was not coal, but coke-fired to ensure cleanliness while working with the raw materials. Its small wheelbase made it perfect for the small, tight turns. It came to the factory in 1925 as a replacement for one of the Kerr engines lost in the war. It took up the prize number one slot and it has held it ever since. The engine worked soundly until 1963, where it was one of the last steam engines to be sold by Cabri. Again, like 14, Cabri couldn't bring themselves to scrap its number one, so it was sold to the Daltry Preservation Society. The engine remained stored until 1982, where the railway was forced to move and the engine was moved to the Gloucester Warwickshire Railway. Despite a number of years of the engine having little to no work, it roared to life in 1984, where for the first time in its history, it was used to pull passengers. It ran for three more years when its extended boiler ticket finally expired. The engine was stored away awaiting overhaul, but as the line got bigger, the need for a smaller engine got less and less. So the now North Gloucester Railway Company sold her to the Birmingham Railway Museum. The museum needed a small shunter, so she was overhauled ready to run again. She ran successfully for the next 10 years without fuss before its boiler ticket expired again and the engine has remained a static ever since. The chances of number one running again is slim, but it is hoped that both engines will be cosmetically restored for Cabri's 200th anniversary coming up this year. Maybe one day both diesel and steam will meet again, both in the original livery and both outside the factory that they worked so tirelessly for. As for the factory, well, it's going for strength to strength and the mini town is created is still considered one of the best places to live and one of the best workplaces to work for. And the chocolate? My personal favourite has to be the marvellous creations, jelly popping candy. So if you ever come to the UK, please try them. They're always a firm favourite in my lunchbox.